This week we're going to talk about uh, two relatively simple uh, but, but very important properties of soil, and that's moisture content and relative density. So moisture content is um, really an expression of how much water is made up of that, that assembly of materials we call soil. And if you remember back to the assignment I gave you week one, I asked you to think about if you were to go outside and, and, and dig a, a hole in the ground and fill it with a bucket, we call that soil. But what is what are um, what is exactly contained in that bucket? Right, obviously you have your mineral particles, as you can see in this diagram. And like most of you identified in that assignment for me, you also have water, right? You've got some organic matter and air. Air is a big one. Air is a, a key ingredient in in soil. And moisture content is what we're gonna look at this week. And it's 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 a variable um, ingredient. Right? You have all of this space available in between the soil particles. And that space can either be occupied by air on a hot, dry August day. It can be fully occupied by water right, on, a, on a saturated April day. Or, as it's usually, uh, it's something in between where it's a combination of both air and water. And next week, when we get into mass volume uh, properties, or mass volume relationships, we'll get a lot more into um, uh, those ratios and, and the, the, the variables we use to express those ratios, like saturation, porosity, void ratio, density, dry density, uh, things like that. This week we're just going to focus on one, and that's moisture content. So this is a, a picture of a a uh, block diagram that we're going to look at for the next couple weeks. And it shows uh, how we kind of organize um, the relationship between dry soil particles, water, and air um, uh, composition in a soil sample. And we'll, we'll get more into the, the, the individual variables here next week. Um, but what I want you to focus on kind of this week is uh, these two here, the mass of the water and the mass of the soil. And, and what we're doing when we're calculating moisture content is we're uh, comparing those two and expressing the mass of water as a uh, relative percentage to the mass of the soil in a soil sample. And it's um, very simply calculated um, by this variable mass of water divided by this variable mass of soil. And it's just our job to separate those two out uh, into constituents that we can measure. And that's what we'll be doing in, in lab this week. Um, just a little bit of a preview going into next week when we start incorporating uh, air into the mix and we look at the volumes of all these constituents. You know, this is a, a, a photograph here of some excavated soil. And if you've had an estimating class, if you've worked with kind of soil uh, calculations, or um, you're probably familiar with terms like uh, bank yards, or bank yards of soil, um, excavated yards of soil, and compacted yards of soil, right? And bank yards are when soil exists in its natural state, like you can see here in this exposed test pit. And an excavated yard of soil uh, is soil that's been excavated. And look at, if you just look at um, kind of those two examples, what's the key difference between between a bank soil condition and an excavated or a loose soil condition? And you're probably noticing right away, it's this introduction of air, right? There's a lot more air space between the soil particles because it's been disturbed and air has been introduced into our soil. And the same weight of soil or the same mass of soil that existed down here in its bank state occupies a lot more space, a lot more volume up here in a loose state. Um, and different soil textures, right, you're familiar now with the name texture because we, we use that to refer to the, the individual particle sizes, right, sand, silts, or clays, or even gravels. You can see the different textures here um, 
uh, result in different uh, air contents in these different soils up here where this uh, kind of deeper sandy soil um, uh, produces a lot fewer air voids between particles than this silty and clay soil over here that kind of clods up and creates these kind of fragmented pieces. So um, a, lo a lot of the, 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 the topics and the concepts we'll be talking about this semester are, are going to be self-contained in the kind of uh, a weekly analysis and we're not going to apply them to a larger bigger picture but I'm sure you've talked about these in some of your other engineering classes or you will get some of these if you're with me in, in future classes like our concrete class that's usually offered in the fall and um, a site evaluation class where we, where we actually do some of this kind of excavation work and analyze soil uh, for, for different applications. Okay, so this is just a slide I use in my uh, concrete class to talk about the different conditions of moisture content that exist on aggregate pieces. So we're talking larger gravel here, but it's the exact same principle applies to soil particles. It's just a smaller scale. And we have an oven dry where there's no moisture uh, present on your soil particles. This is probably the most common where you have uh, an air dry soil particle that has some residual moisture based on either humidity, depending on what the dew point and uh, uh, atmospheric conditions are, or, or, or even, I guess it could exist in a vapor form and condense inside. Um, this is a unique condition of uh, water content important to aggregates in, in a concrete design that we're not really going to talk about. But this is uh, the other common example of a moisture condition in soil and that's um, a saturated or a wet condition where all of the individual pore spaces inside the, 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 the soil particle are full, plus there's soil adhering to the outside uh, as well. So you, you have both absorbed AB, uh, alpha, bravo, and adsorbed uh, moisture AD, uh, alpha, delta soil or water. And then if we go back to that soil uh, block diagram, I'm just kind of itemizing out here the equation that we're going to use. Um, water percentage or moisture content is just equal to the mass of the water that we measure, uh, typically in grams this semester, divided by the mass of the dry soil particles uh, measured and expressed in grams. Now we can't really measure um, directly the mass of the water, right? That's a, a result of of evaporating it off and drying it. So what we do is we measure the original soil um, called the mass total expressed over here at the bottom where the mass of the water plus the mass of the dry soil equals your total mass. Right. So that's what you dig out of the ground. That's where you get everything in its natural or, or uh, current conditions. So the original total mass minus the dry mass results in the mass of the water. And you get that condition by throwing your soil sample in an oven for 16 hours and you let it dry out. So what's gone had to have been water. So you take your mass of water divided by mass of dry soil and like everything we want to do, or every time we want to turn something into a percentage, you have to multiply it by 100. And there's a couple of these mass volume relationships um, that we're going to be working on next week that require a percentage expression. Um, some others require a, a ratio expression, so they're unit lists, and we can we can um, disregard that 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 factor. And this is a real real basic, real simple test we're doing this week, uh, but it's also important. I mean, we're going to be calculating moisture content almost every week from here on out for all of our different soil tests. It becomes a very important uh, property to know uh, for the Proctor compaction test, for the, um, the Atterberg limits, right, the plastic tests we're going to be doing. So it's, that's why I like to spend an entire week just kind of focusing strictly on moisture content um, because it, it's, it, um, it's something that we repeat over and over and over again. So I want to ask, or I want, I want you to ask yourself, uh, 
So before we advance, I want to ask you this to think about this question. Can you have a soil with a moisture content greater than 100%? And go ahead and uh, pause this. I'd like you to just spend some actual time giving this some serious thought. You know, is that even possible? And if it is, if you think it is, what does that mean about your soil? So go ahead and pause and I'll come back and answer this question for you. Okay, if you thought about that, um, the answer is yes. You can absolutely have a soil with a moisture content greater than 100%. Because we're not trying to uh, express water as a percentage of the entire sample, right? The total mass. You're comparing that water, that mass of your water, to the mass of the dry soil. So it's more of a ratio. It's more of a, a, a moisture ratio, not really a moisture content. Um, but uh, we express it in terms of a percentage, and we call it moisture content. But if you had a moisture content computed out to be 150%, or we'll make the math easy, 200%, that just means you have twice as much mass of water as you do mass of dry soil particles. And if you think about... Uh, the soils you worked with last week in that ribbon test, some of those soils took very, very little water at all before they started to fall apart. Right, Your sandy soils. Your sandy soils generally have a, 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 a much lower moisture content threshold than your cohesive soils, like a clay. And a couple of you worked with that pure clay. And you can literally start throwing water on clay day after day and it'll just keep soaking it up and it is possible to have 120 130 even 150 percent moisture content because clay will take on more than its own weight in water um, through both uh, absorption and adhesion and uh, result in extremely high moisture contents and that's what we're going to see in lab this week i've got a couple different soil types uh, um, uh, separated out, they're soaking right now, and we're going to look and see how uh, d different soil textures can take on uh, different amounts of water. So the other thing we're going to do um, this week is talk about uh, relative density of soil. And I wanted to start into this just by throwing that old riddle out here that I'm sure you've heard before, is what weighs more, a pound of feathers or a pound of lead? And you know the answer to this is that they both weigh the same. Um, but it's a really a question of, of, of density. And we're going to kind of use this as our lead-in to talk about density and relative density. But you can easily have a pound of feathers, right? It just takes up a lot more uh, volume than a pound of lead does. And we know density, you know, from... Uh, from early science classes that you, I'm sure you've had before. Density is nothing more than something's mass, right, or how much something weighs, divided by its volume. So you're relating its, its, the weight to its volume. And as this, uh, well, even if this picture doesn't imply it, you can certainly infer that you need a lot more volume of, of feathers to yield the same mass as you do volume of lead. And we are going to use density um, next week with our mass volume relations. Uh, density becomes really important when we get into topics like the Proctor compaction test. But this week, I kind of want us to focus more on relative density. And what relative density is, is it's how much something weighs when compared to an equal volume of water. And that word is key right there, equal. Um, what we want to know is how does uh, how much does something weigh if we, if we could um, uh, have guaranteed equal volumes uh, of a substance? And you're going to see it in the, in the book in some of the lab discussions the terms uh, interchanged: relative density and specific gravity. Um, for all intents and purposes, they mean the exact same thing in this class. And like we said, it's how much something weighs in relation to an equal volume of water. So water becomes kind of that reference material. And water has a relative density of 1. Because if you compare water to itself, right, water divided by water, 
you get 1.0. And if you think about things that float on water or things that are less dense than water, um, helium is a extremely um, uh, less, much more less less dense than water, almost uh, two thousandths um, uh, as dense. Air is a uh, quite a bit more dense than helium, but still considerably less dense than water. And that's why, as you know from swimming in a swimming pool, air bubbles float. They'll float up to the top of water. Uh, a, a cottonwood tree, right? Everyone that lives in Montana, I'm sure, is familiar with cottonwood trees. And you see them floating down the river, the high runoff season, and they're floating on top of the water because a cottonwood tree's relative density is only about 0.4, right? If you had one cubic foot of water and a one cubic foot block sawed out of a cottonwood tree, it would only weigh 40% as much as water. And then you have things that sink, right? Um, milk is slightly more dense than, than water, so it has a slightly higher relative density. Uh, glass, obviously if you throw a piece of glass in water, it's going to sink. It's 2.6 times heavier than water. And gold, um, it's kind of a, uh, a common one to know, 19.3. Um, gold is 19.3 times heavier than water. It's a very, very dense element. What's important to us is soil particles in this class. And soil particles, you can assume, if you don't know, have a relative density of 2.65. And you can see I, I separated out some uh, soil into their individual texture sizes. Uh, um, and, and from gravels and through your sands down into silts and there might even be some clay in here um, but every single one of these particles regardless of its size has a relative density of 2.65 right uh, absolute volume and absolute mass aren't related here right relative density is a unitless term it's simply comparing the weight of this to the weight of an equal volume of that. And the number is the ratio expression. So if you don't know a soil's relative density, assume it to be 2.65, except for clays. Clays are a little fatter. They're a little more dense. Um, they're about 2.7, even up to 2.8. Um, kind of makes sense if we look at glass here. Glass, we said, was about 2.6. And glass is made from silica, right, which is essentially just a mineral particle, so it makes sense that glass is going to be rel uh, similar to relative density of um, raw soil particles. I don't, if you've ever watched David Letterman, I don't know if I'm dating myself now, I think he's been off the air for a number of years, but uh, David Letterman used to have this a uh, great skit called Will It Float? And, it, um, you know, he, he'd bring out this big tub of, a tub of water and they'd uh, have some sort of object and make a game out of guessing is it going to sink or is it going to float? And, and essentially, he's, he's performing a relative density test, right? Um, you know, YouTube it sometime, David Letterman, Will It Float? And most of them, I think, are copyrighted. They're, they're keeping them off of YouTube, but there's a pretty good one of a cheese log. And I'll let you guess whether or not a cheese log is going to sink or float. Um, but he always had, like, a, a couple of models with a, uh, a girl with hula hoops and another girl with a grinder shooting sparks off of a metal plate. <laughs> so it's, uh, it was funny. But it's, it's, actual, it's actual science, too. So there's some key numbers I'd like you to remember here uh, for the rest of the semester, especially the next two weeks. Uh, the number 1, the number 62.4, and the number 2.65. And number 1 represents the density of water when we express it in the specific units of grams per cubic centimeter. right? And that's the units that we're going to work primarily with this semester. We're going to measure things in grams on our scale and we're going to express things in terms of a cubic centimeter of volume. 62.4 is the density of water when you change your units into pounds and cubic feet. So if you go through your dimensional analysis and convert grams into pounds and cubic centimeters into cubic feet, 
you're going to essentially multiply and divide uh, factors and give yourself um, this relationship of 62.4 times uh, greater. So water is not changing, right? The density of water is not changing. We're just expressing it in terms of a different unit here. So we have a much larger sample, a bucket, a cubic foot big, as compared to a little cup, a cubic centimeter big. And we're using different terms of mass to measure that. We will use density expressed in pounds when we perform the Proctor compaction test because that has more of an engineering and construction application. And on a job site, right, your earthwork and your density, you're, 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 you're measuring in, in cubic feet or yards of soil and you're, you're weighing things in pounds. Um, in a lab setting, we're using much smaller samples. We're going to be working in grams and cubic centimeters. And like I mentioned a couple slides ago, 2.65 is the relative density of any soil, unless it's one of those cohesive clays, and then you can assume it to be a little greater. So if we derive out um, how relative density is calculated, the relative density of a soil, right, you're comparing soil to water, so it's the density of a soil compared to the density of water, and if we re-express the density of soil, right, we know that to be the mass of soil divided by the volume of soil, still divided by density of water, um, that would e express out to mass of the soil expressed in grams divided by volume of soil expressed in cubic centimeters divided by one. Because like we just looked up here, the density of water in grams per cubic centimeter is one. So anytime you divide something by one, it goes away. And since our units are common, grams per cubic centimeter and grams per cubic centimeter, this simply reduces to um, that the relative density of soil is equal to the mass of soil in grams divided by the volume of soil in grams. Now mass of soil in grams is easily something we can measure because we have scales. The volume of soil cannot be easily measured because soil has an indeterminate a shape and particle size and a lot of air spaces between them. So this is something that we're going to have to solve for. And that's the purpose of the, the other portion of our lab this week, is to um, be able to quantify the relative density of a soil by measuring its mass and solving for its volume. And we're going to do that with um, two easy, two easy um, lab procedures. Right? First test we're going to do is measuring moisture content. We're just going to use small samples and little tin cups. We're going to weigh them in their wet existing condition. We're going to throw them in an oven, and you'll come back and you'll weigh them when they're dry. And it doesn't get any simpler than that. There's a little more to measuring relative density. Um, when you're using coarse gravels, if you may have done this lab before, um, you can weigh... Um, a saturated gravel in air and then weigh it while it's suspended in a basket in a bucket of water and what you're essentially doing is negating the effect of the mass of the water that's contained in those gravel particles um, it's very similar to if you've ever done a um, a very accurate uh, body fat content uh, test by weighing yourself in a swimming pool it's kind of the same principle here um, but we're not going to do that. We're going to be working with the finer particles, right, soils. So we're going to use pinkometers. And the, the principle is pretty basic. Um, this is the actual device used for coarse soil relative densities. It's a mason jar with a funnel on top. Um, I, I, we have one. I kind of don't like it because it's hard to get that water meniscus back to the exact same level each time. So we'll try and use either glass speakers or these pinkometers which are really nice with the narrow necks and the etch line there at the half a liter or 500 milliliter uh, mark it, it makes for uh, um, um, more consistent results but you basically compare the mass of uh, a glass speaker filled up with just water and then you pour out that water fill up your beaker with your soil and bring your water level right back up to the exact same level. So that way you know you have 
the same volume. You've controlled the volume variable in your calculation, but what you've changed is the mass. Because when you put soil in this beaker and then filled it back up with water, you've displaced something that used to be just water with now something that is heavier than water. And it's the difference in mass that allows you to determine the volume of soil, um, or I'm sorry, the volume of the particles that are now taking up space that used to be occupied by water. So those are the tests we're going to be performing this week. Um, I will go over at the beginning of class what's required for the lab write-ups, and we'll be needing to perform a, a kind of a, a comprehensive lab write-up as a deliverable uh, for every, almost every lab the rest of the semester.